basically uh, <laughs> Sorry about this. This is actually only my second time testifying. So no, it's no, 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 problem, no, problem. no, no, no. I, it, and obviously, obviously, you know, we we do support you know everyone actually going out. These are labeled you know freedom to work, uh, uh, right to work. We you do have a right to go and you know find a job or something like that. Right. But what we're trying to get you at this is that uh, uh, you know we're trying to get everyone the ability to choose whether or not they want to join a, join or not join. A so, 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 so that's the freedom part there that, that we're discussing. Okay. I understand. I, I, I disagree, as you, as okay. you know. But it, it's almost like, so you go to work for a an employer, and then as an employee, you should almost have any freedom that you want with that employer. Is it that kind of deal, or is it just... Right. Like, Each individual should, yeah, I, and, and, and don't get me wrong, you can still have you know the freedom to also join the union if, if, if you so choose, and, right. and then you can... Collectively bargain between, you know, or the union co collectively bargain between uh, the employer and for you. Uh, but also, you can go to the employer yourself and bargain, bargain yourself. Try to cut your That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, and and I don't think that has worked out kind of in the past, and that's kind of how, you know, kind of uh, organized labor unions came to be with that thing, trying to go at it alone because then you can you can end up pitting. Different employees against it, and it's and it still happens now within labor organizations. For example, they tried to put pit my local union against a local union in Seattle, same union, different locals, but they tried to pit us against each other when when seeing who could drive the wage down down lower. But um, yeah, it was just a question about the the freedom or. Well, and, and I think I think one of the things that, things that we do work. forget from time to time is that. Uh, you know, a lot of times whenever people are talking about economics, capitalism, and, and, and all those things, that they talk about supply and demand. I do think that there is, you know, a supply and demand in labor as well, and I think you saw it too whenever your two unions, you know, were, were working, you know, kind of against each other in, in that particular instance. Tempting. Yeah. Uh, tempting. <laughs> I don't know if it worked or not, but uh, that's entirely up to you. No, no, okay. Uh, but uh, but again, you know that's that's your freedom, and, and all we want to do is extend the same freedom, you know, to each individual worker. Uh, you know, there's several associations, you know, uh, that that maintain the same type of freedom, and uh, you know, as far as the teachers go, police officers, firemen, and we're just wanting to extend that same freedom to uh, the rest of uh, uh, the union members across the state of Missouri. Okay, all right, that was my question. Thank no problem. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Scott Ramshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. My name is Scott Ramshaw. I'm a member of the, member of the Plumbers and Pipers Local Union, 562 out of St. Louis. I'm a 35-year member of that organization. I started when I was 18. I had the uh, opportunity, had the opportunity to uh, have that training that was made available to me to go through an apprenticeship program and uh, work myself through the trade. Became a journeyman. I uh, worked as a foreman, a uh, general foreman, superintendent, and now in 2004 I, I started lobbying for the plumbers and pipefitters out of St. Louis. Um, as you talk to, as you hear during your conversation today, you talk about business relationships and business partners. We also have contractors associations, mechanical contractors association out of St. Louis and the plumbing industry, industry council that uh, Ray uh, testified, you heard t testify earlier. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to talk about. I know there's, uh, when we talk about communities and jobs and different things, one of the things that a pipe fitter does, he works on industry from nuclear powerhouse all the way down through manufacturing facilities, commercial facilities, light commercial facilities, and even residential homes. We've been successful across the state in the 67 counties that we represent being successful in all those different uh, parts of the industry. Um, one of the things you need to think about um, when we talk about training and different things, you know with a nuclear power house a wall thickness on pipe is three and a half inches or more. It just depends what part of the reactor or what part of the where the piping system is and it could go down to uh, schedule 40. But those welds are critical welds. Those are the welds that the weld metal has to be stronger than what is actually the, the pipe itself. That metal for the when it's finished welded out and it's x-rayed in the process because it's that thick you have to put it in different layers and, and go through it. And one of the reasons I talk about that is because you have the training that it takes to train individuals 
in the industry in certain certain parts of whatever it takes, whatever craft you have, there's a uh, you need that you need that ability with the apprenticeship program, so that a journey, an apprentice is working with a journeyman, so that he can train him through the not only to uh, learn the trade secrets of the trade and make the job move along, you know, in a fiscal manner, but you need that knowledge one-on-one -on -one training on day to day, and that's where that partnership comes in with the contractors and even the end users, me and Monsanto, Ameren UE, Coca-Cola, Anheuser-Busch. There's a lot that goes into play. So it's not just, uh, they all understand that the contract has a union, union security clause and they choose to use contractors that have the ability to finish a project on time, under budget sometimes. It just depends how it all lays out. So the risk, the risk that the uh, end user takes and the money they have to put up for a project, it's important. One of the things I want to talk about too is, uh, you know, I've been up here since 2004. There has been a few economic development things that have gotten out of here, but uh, when things aren't moving here, I've, I've been in D.C. working with the uh, Waterways Council, and our goal was to get the water legislation passed. And the reason we were able to do that is because business, the agricultural groups, and when I say business, I'm talking Fortune 500 companies are all working together with labor to get that leg legislation passed. That legislation passed last year, and it's one of the few legislations that passed United States Congress and was signed by the President. So it's about it's about Missouri. Missouri's important to me, my family, my granddaughter's in Springfield. Uh, economic development, I mean the highway system in Springfield, I'm not sure if people don't have the expendable money to go to Branson, but we all know the highway system in Springfield has two great intersections. Maybe three or four. I can't remember them all. It's, uh, hi I think it was uh, Highway 44 and 13, Highway 44 and 65. And those were probably built by the building trades people of this state. So, um, if there's any questions, I can uh, answer for you. I just want to make sure that you understand that the plumbers and pipefitters are opposed to legislation 116 and 569. Perfect. Mission inquire quickly. All right, sir. Uh, is it true that an apprentice program in plumbers and pipe fitters, carpenters, sheet metal workers costs about forty-five thousand dollars per year, and it's five years long? I'm sure each cost. You know, I don't. I can't give you the exact dollar amount. Each each program is probably different depending on how they work with their international. But there is a cost. That cost is no cost to that apprenticeship. There's continuing education that go to journeymen in the field that they have that's free at night. And there's continuing uh, education that needed is because of mechanical license or plumbing licensing. So uh, there, there's a lot of things that go into keeping Missouri moving forward. Uh, we do need economic development. Economic development will solve a lot of things. Um, I know I had something else here. Uh, Educational solve a lot of things. Incentives for businesses. I mean, I'm not sure what the answer is to that, but one of the things that we resolved when we were working with the Waterways Council is that if we're all sitting at the table, instead of having all these little groups trying to figure stuff out and, and uh, not make things happen, the, the easiest way to solve a lot of these problems in the state is if we're all at the table trying to resolve these issues. And if I can be helpful to sit with anybody and if they have a comment or want to come by their office, I'll be more than happy to come by. Um, I'll get you my contact information as I make rounds. So, but you also have documentation that, but from your union, or I'm sure the sheet metal workers do. Any of the fully apprentice trained that have apprentice programs that your journeyman could go anywhere in the world and be welcomed because of their ability to do the job. In fact, it's quite a bit like if someone would decide to go to a doctor who hadn't been through medical school or a lawyer headed up through law school, why would you want to hire someone who's going to be working behind a wall or in your business that wasn't fully trained, which is equivalent to a college education? That's true. I mean, uh, we do have members up in Iowa. We do have members in Nebraska, depending on what facilities left, you know, couldn't get the incentive package that they needed for economic development. Um, our international is just uh, recently, I think it was a couple of years ago, they have an agreement with Australia now with the plumbing individuals in Australia. They just recently signed an agreement with the plumbing industry in, the, uh, in Ireland, the country of Ireland. So uh, we know what we have is, is good. We know we can sell it. And uh, 
we believe we have a lot to offer that nobody else has or can. So we're proud of what we do every day. One last thing. I'm, I'm, uh, last year with the Boeing issue, didn't the contractors and particularly the um, St. Louis Building and Construction Trades, Jeff Abusi, got together with Boeing and offered them round the clock, 24 hours a day, workmanship by journeyman workers, three eight hour shifts with no guaranteed overtime. And that was gonna cut the cost of that building, which was like seven stories inside, from five years to 2.9 years because of the quality workmanship and the working out of this issue with the unions. And it was only because they had to go to back to Seattle and give them an opportunity to work on that retirement package, which only passed 5149, we would have gotten all that Boeing 777X aircraft. Well, I don't know about the end part of it, but I do know that the building trades does offer uh, ship pay, and that's open to any end user that's thinking about coming in Missouri. I know that the uh, head of the building trades, Gina Walsh, Senator Walsh, and uh, Jeff Abusi and Elaine on the other side of the state, on Kansas City side, they're more than happy to sit down with any company, any rep, any individual to figure out what works in their area and help to uh, move your, your uh, representative uh, or your, your community along. It's, I mean, I'll give you an example. My son, I was going to ask him, I, well, I did set it up so he could apply for the apprenticeship program and he got in, but he decided it was not for him. And over the years, um, the welders that I worked with, you have, uh, you know, their eyes start to go. So we continually are looking for individuals that have three to five years welding experience with certain criteria that can meet our program. We're willing to train those, take those individuals to another state to train them free. Some of the individuals that, are, if they're in the state, we're, 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 we're able to look at them and see if they can, we can fit them into an apprenticeship program or metal trades program. But nobody's going to offer those individuals the opportunity to work at, at the, at the, with the benefits that we have, whether it's a wage, the health care, the pension, the 401k. And there's no guarantee you're going to work 40 hours the rest of your life. You know, you may only work six months depending on the workload, but you do have an opportunity to travel somewhere else. Um, even with the oil sands up in Canada, there's, they've been trying to figure out, and our international has Canada too, you know, they're trying to figure out that the work slow in the United States, the, for the critical welders or the workforce that's needed, they're going to send them to Canada. So, uh, you know, all of us here in this room with that great seal behind, on the wall behind us, I mean, that, we want to make Missouri better. And so these people behind me. So, um, not sure why we always, you know, um, American manufacturers, I mean, the Chamber of Commerce, I mean, we work with the Chamber of Commerce, they get deals done all the time. <coughs> they don't ever talk about it. I'm okay with that. It is what it is. So. Thank you, Scott, and thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your patience. Thank you, sir. I'd like to hear from Larry Spilker, please. Spilter with Buckhorn Incorporated. Okay, Rachel Payton, please. Hi, I'm Rachel Payton. I'm the Deputy State Director for Americans for Prosperity. And in the interest of time, I have written testimony. Sorry. In the interest of time, I have written testimony um, attached to my witness form that I think is probably in the best interest of everyone here. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tom Hager. Thank you. It's good to sit down. My name is Tom Hager. I'm recently retired owner and founder of Acme Construction and Ac Acme Erectors. I set up an ESOP and sold a company to employees and it's worked out quite well. They're a $30 million a year plus operation. They hire all the basic trades, carpenters, millwrights, iron workers, laborers, operators, cement masons, and sometimes water makers. We keep 75 to 150 people going most of the time. We do industrial work, a lot of steel, conveyors, any kind of equipment setting, from food and beverage, pharmaceutical, quarries, steel mills, six flag rides, 
for, for all the bigger customers, Ameren, Monsanto, Anheuser-Busch, Missouri U, chemical plants, used to do a lot of work at Chrysler. I'm originally from Union, Missouri, Franklin County. Got out of high school, went to school at Warrensburg, that didn't work out very well. Realized I was better fit for construction, so I left college, started as a laborer, got in the Carpenter's Apprenticeship Program, worked as a carpenter, millwright, foreman, general foreman, operation I was working for, put me in the office to run their field. Moved up to vice president of operations, and boom, they went out of business. Pedaled around trying to find work, they were pretty tough and it was rough. Guy called me and said, you want to buy Acme Erectors? And I said, hell, I know all about construction. I thought I did anyway, but I don't know much about running a company. And when you're broke and you're hungry, it doesn't take long to learn. So I bought this old dried up company. With no customers, a bunch of old broken tools, a workforce that all retired. It was just me and a part-time bookkeeper. And she was meaner than I was. Chrysler was going pretty strong at the time and I had a job modifying some conveyors. So I worked at night with my tools with the crew and then during the day I could work on the build in the business in the office. Things worked out pretty well. The next five or six years was a little bit better. I worked six days a week, 12 hours a day, no vacations. to get upgrades and plants so most of our work was on weekends and holidays. But it, it paid well. So. And I live in Eureka. Tim Jones country. I'm a pretty big supporter of Tim Jones on a lot of things, not on right to work. I'm friends with his mother and father. I'm very active with AGC, directors and riggers, and council <coughs> construction employers. I lead a negotiating team of contractors when it comes time to redo contracts with most of the AFL CIO people in St. Louis. I've been involved with this business for about 50 years. I've been on both sides of the labor issue. I work with my tools, and now I'm on the management side, and that gives me a pretty good insight. I've worked out of town. I've worked in non-union situations along with union situations. You have the same problems everywhere. It's not the unions that's causing problems. You're always going to have labor management issues. Management just has to be strong and be firm. The unions got their job to do, but we got our job to do too. There have been some abuses in organized labor. I can't speak for the manufacturing operation or for service unions or teachers and all that. But the construction business is altogether different now than it was when I started. Labor is our partner. They realize they can't do it without us. We don't have any seniority. We have the right to hire and fire. If somebody can't cut it, they're gone. The union doesn't ask me why unless there's some kind of abuse on my part. If somebody can't do the job, they're gone. And the union understands and they'll back me. There's no feather bedding. We work together. We have jointly administered training plans. The Greater St. Louis Building Trade spends over $35 million a year on training. You weren't too far off of that 48 grand. That's a hell of a lot of money. Who's going to train these people if the unions go? All of our training, all of our tradesmen have completed OSHA 10 hour courses. Most of our leaders, superintendents, foremen, have 30 hour training. That all makes our industry better. We have people that go through MSHA training, which is for mines and quarries and stuff like that. That training doesn't cost the taxpayer a nickel. All this goes and shows up on our safety records. The unions of con the users of construction, our customers, realize this and have lower insurance programs because of it. Most of our trades have journeyman upgrade programs that keep workers abreast of the new technology and products. Our unions have their own health care programs, so we're not draining on the public services. We have legitimate pension plans where a worker can retire and live com comfortably without being a drain on society. These pension funds are invested in firms that turn around and build facilities for all of us to use. Building trades are part of the community. Last year, the St. Louis Building Trades donated over $3 million to charity. We spend countless hours and dollars trying to work on the problems of racial diversity and the issues involved with that. Nobody ever hears about that. The unions of the day are part of this industry. They're part of our community, and they're doing their part to better it. We need to keep a middle class in Missouri. 
outside union construction workers to make a respectable living to improve their quality of life and educate their adult children. Working people in Missouri don't have to live in house trailers. Thank you. I'll take your question. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have, have one question. Um, you know, you, a lot of you all today have give, given very convincing testimony as to why you believe that right to work is not good for Missouri. And, and, and certainly, I don't think they represented Burleson's bill. I know most of us don't want to see uh, anyone uh, lose a job or the unions get weaker or if they're doing a good job, that's not the goal. But here's, my perspective is only a rural perspective because I live in a town of 7,000 people. We're a bedroom community to Springfield. Our biggest employer is the public school system. And we've got empty buildings one in particular, it's been setting empty since 1998-99. They used to make plastic pumpkins like you sell it, you see at Halloween. They went to China. There is opportunity now because of the labor force in China gradually creeping up to possibly bring that building back to life and start making those pumpkins again. The equipment's sitting there. But, and this is just one example, but they tell us that, and, and Mr. McCarty and, and the chamber and, and the lady from the Manufacturing Association, they tell us that the information is out there, the facts are there, that these companies, they're, they're using the right to work issue as one of the factors in going to a different, different state. How do we overcome that? How do we fill these empty buildings in these small communities where, where this particular plant at one time probably had 150 employees and would have made it probably the second largest employer in my town behind the public school, maybe the biggest back then. How do we do that? How do we, how do we convince these companies to come back to Missouri and not go to those other states where they've got the same situation? They've got buildings in Arkansas setting the same way because, you know, that they, we all went through that back 15 years ago. How do we do that? I, that's, that's beyond me. I don't know. I go through the same argument when I go through union negotiations. And then you, you know, it could be a race to the bottom. You know, everything left St. Louis to go south because it was cheaper. And then it went to Mexico because it was cheaper. It got down to Mexico and they thought, well, hell, we can go to China. It's cheaper. Now they're leaving China and they're going to Bangladesh and places like that. Let's just hope that someday they'll come back here. I don't, I don't know the answer. But you know, it may be raised to the bottom, and it would be for the construction industry, like as you guys have convinced us, or your testimonies have. But we're talking about putting jobs back in a community that would settle. They'd be tickled to death for a ten or a fifteen dollar an hour job. Like they need work, and that's what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to reduce anybody's lifestyle that already has a nice lifestyle. We're just trying to provide jobs. Get them off the welfare well, line. I surely think it will reduce the lifestyle. I mean, why would I pay fifty dollars an hour for a carpenter if I was a greedy devil, which I'm not? Why would I pay fifty dollars an hour for a carpenter if I can get one for thirty? I compete against people. It costs me to put a union carpenter, union hour on a job, I don't know, sixty bucks an hour with all the fringes and all the hocus pocus that goes with it. But they're worth it. I compete against people who pay thirty, thirty-five. My people know what they're doing. They got all this training. They're so safe. We don't ever have any union. We don't have a union problem. Very damn few. We don't have any insurance problems. We got trained people. I can do with three people what it takes six or seven other people to do. These people come up from Texas and try to compete against us. We make them look like schoolgirls. School children, excuse me. <laughs> Help me out here. <laughs> Well, quality is quality. I mean, if and, and those of you that are building roads and bridges and, and state contracts, government contracts, you know, huge buildings in St. Louis where they need quality and, and meet standards, do, you, it, do, you, is, do we have the numbers? Do we have the facts that right to work will, will reduce the quality or, or will you lose those jobs? Will you usually lose union jobs to the 
if they can't perform the way you all do? Well, why would a guy belong to a union? You know, if he doesn't have. Well, there's, there, again, all we know is the facts that's been presented. We're, we're meet, we've been told that they're. The unions are still prospering. Well, the right as I hear you, the facts. Yeah, I mean, I understand. Lieutenant Governor Kinder had this, this thing over here from the Post Dispatch, talking about the city. The city of St. Louis is, is a, a little bitty operation compared to what it was because everybody's moving out. In our St. Louis city, it, it's it's tough, and there are no jobs. But that don't mean that the city's falling apart. I mean, you can take a, a, a group of people in a little area. Unemployment's relative is 50, 60 percent in our St. Louis. It, it's tough, but that don't mean that the St. Louis area is falling apart. Facts, you can do a lot with facts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Representative Weber. Quite briefly, Mr. Chairman. Briefly, please. So, I'm, I'm guessing you're not a huge fan of government overreach in your business. Pretty much. Okay. And right now. When you negotiate you know, a bargaining agreement with the labor group, you're free to decide whether you want to include, whether you want to negotiate on a union security clause or not. I'm not. And you choose, you've, you've chosen to uh, to negotiate with a workforce that has a, a union right. security clause. Yeah, I could go out of business and start a non-union operation in a minute if I wanted to. Right. If I could get away from it. Okay. So you could do that. So does it bother you that this legislation would remove your ability or your choice as an employer to decide which type of workforce you want to negotiate with? That's why I'm here. Okay. Yes, it does. So, so you view this as government overreach into your rights as an employer? Right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'll give up my soft seat. Thank you, sir. Mr. Greg Johns, would you like to testify, please? Chairman and committee members, I'm Greg Jones with Missourians for Right to Work, not Missourians for Freedom to Work, but Right to Work. And uh, my testimony has changed a little bit as I hear all of these things. Uh, I've been down in Texas and seen a lot of places down there. And as we had this one man said that uh, he was down at a plant, I don't know how many thousands of workers down there that were underpaid. Well. I spent 12 years with the FLCIO, United Canada Workers of America, Brotherhood of Beverage Workers, and was a union agent and a business agent and an organizer. And why aren't they down there, the union agents, if this is such a place with underpaid wages, organizing that place? It's not that hard to organize a place where they're underpaid. So there's something else going on there. Uh, I was down in Tennessee. Uh, you guys would be called that the UAW went to Tennessee to try to uh, get the VW organized and they lost the election. And the reason those guys didn't vote for that is because the way they were, the company was working with the UAW, but the whole thing was they were going to make less money as a union member than they were as they, would, as they were right now. So they did not want the UAW down there. And that's not to say when I talked to them that they wouldn't be organized in some other union that they had trust in. I'm talking about the guys I talked to. And about, I don't understand this about, we go through this, this I think this is the eighth year. I'm looking at him. That <laughs> the right to work doesn't get rid of unions. We'll discuss a little bit about that. Uh, you, I guess we all understand, you talk about construction in St. Louis, construction in St. Louis, how great it's going and everything else. Well, why is House Bill 582 introduced by Senator Curtis, an African American, on the right to work issue? That's the right to work bill introduced by, and that's for the construction industry. Senator Curtis lives in Berkeley and is concerned about the construction industry in the state of Missouri, so he introduced the right to work bill. A Democrat introduced the right to work bill. Okay? And you guys can do whatever you want to do to try to, whatever you do on that. I just, uh, 
but I say amen to somebody that no matter who it is, if you believe in something, do something. That's what you should be doing. Uh, and I, like I say, I've been with the unions. I've been a union member. Or my family's been union members. Uh, we're independents, Democrats, or whatever. Just, but we believe it because unions do a good job. Samuel Gomper started that. We talked about going back to the coal mines and all that garbage. And it was garbage. It was slave labor. And Samuel Gomper started that and built the AFL, American Federation of Labor. And then they believe it was later on the CIO years later. Uh, but we just took it, had a Frank Lutz poll, you guys were three with him, and they asked the question, workers should have the right to decide whether to join a union. They should never be forced or coerced to join to pay dues to a union as condition of union employment, as condition of employment. Now this was given to union members only. 80% of the union members agreed that right to work was the way to go. 80%. That's a Frank Luntz poll, and also he put in there, union workers should have the right to know how their dues money is being spent. The Department of Labor should disclose union spending on the internet to ensure accountability. 89% of the union members agreed on that. And that's the problem I had when I was in the union. We didn't know where our money was being spent. It was going to certain things that we didn't like. And that's, and that's could be one union here, one union there, and not all unions. That's just here and there, seated in. And also, if you wanted Representative Burns to talk about statistics, so I thought I'd just bring some statistics. Uh, Missouri, in the last three years, has lost 61,000 union members. 61,000 union members are gone from the state of Missouri. But overall, in jobs, we gained 28,000 new jobs, but 61,000 union jobs went away in Missouri. And yes, we are going down. We're 8.4 percent of the of the entire workforce is now union members, and so every year is going down, down, down. And that's going back 10 years. In 10 years, totally, we lost 101,000 union members. So what is going on? What's happening? Indiana just passed the right to work bill, 2012. And they did it, and in fact, I had to, if some of you guys remember, I had a representative from Michigan down here to testify in this hearing back in 2012 when Michigan went right to work. And he explained why they did that, because they were going broke, and they had to do something. And he had all the things approved that right to work wouldn't make them destroy anything, it would bring things back. So this, these are statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's all these are here. In 2014, Indiana became a right-to-work state, and the union membership was going down, down, down. Indiana last year created 120,000 overall jobs. And out of those jobs, 50,000 of those jobs were union members. And they weren't cheap jobs either. I got to uh, talk to the state Commerce Secretary in Indiana. These jobs are Nettleworks, a company out of California has recently purchased a huge pharmaceutical facility. Upwards of $90 million is going to go to the enhancement and refurbishment with that. Toyota announced a $130 million expansion in Princeton. Amazon in southern Indiana announced an $80 million warehousing facility. Cummings, high-powered Cummings engines, is is putting $220 million into a project expansion in Seymour, Indiana. Steel Dynamics announced that right to work was the key reason why they came to Pittsburgh, Indiana with a 50, separate, excuse me, $75 million facility project to be built there. And Ross Diagnostic announced $300 million expansion in Indianapolis. And it goes on and on and on. There's 175 more deals going on. And they aren't cheap jobs. These are high-paying, good-paying jobs in Indiana. So Indiana feels that this is icing on a cake. It helped them to rebuild their community, and, and they are building the union membership. Good-paying jobs. Looking around us, we talked about statistics about states around us. Uh,
Kansas gained last year 35,000 overall jobs, 1,000 was union members. Nebraska gained 7,000 jobs overall last year, 1,000 more union members. Iowa, 48,000 overall jobs, 13,000 more union members. Then we have Tennessee, that they've lost union membership, and Oklahoma lost union membership. Kentucky, they lost 5,000 union memberships and 21,000 overall jobs, and their force union is a state. Illinois, last year, lost 20,000 union jobs and 103,000 other jobs. This is, it's, it's sad what's going on. I drove around these states, I looked at these things, what's going on. Alabama, which has 700,000 less employees than we do in Missouri, last year gained 1,000 union jobs and they lost 7,000 overall jobs. So losing 7,000 jobs, they still gained 1,000 jobs. Alabama has 204,000 union members, which is 10.8% of the workforce. Missouri has 214,000 union members, 8.4% of the workforce. If we keep going on next year, Alabama will have more union members than Missouri. These are just statistics of the Bureau of Standards. And then I thought I'd just gallop poll. I've been here 38 years in Missouri, and this makes me sick. Gallup poll ranked Missouri as the eighth most miserable state. And that wording, look it up, talk to your phone, I do. It tells me that. <coughs> CNBC ranked Missouri as the third most miserable state and as the ninth most miserable state for working moms. CNBC also said in Kansas City and St. Louis, St. Louis, optimism is low and the crime rate and pollution are high. The U.S. Census Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, all put Missouri near the bottom of the rankings, which included income, employment, economics, job opportunity, and crime rate. Missouri, they say, is lagging behind. CNBC and Forbes reported suggest that this quality of life in Missouri can affect its appeal to business, and future economic growth affecting Missouri's ability to foster a successful business environment. <coughs> These aren't me. I'm just giving you what they have. You can look it up on your phones right now and it's there. How dare them tell us that they're the most miserable state? And we got to wake up and slow the rules and work together. We do. I've been a union. Yes, sir. The unions pay good money. A lot of times they pay more money and they do the job. But good gracious, uh, working in both California and Arizona with a force unionism state, Arizona. In Arizona, I represented Pepsi, Coca-Cola, 7-Up, and Dr. Pepper, and our employees, my union members in Arizona, made more money than they did in California. I think that if you have some good business agents around with the negoti negotiating contracts and do what they're supposed to do, you can do the job. And I think in these places that you're talking about in Texas that are underpaid, like I said, Get out there and organize these plates.